All right. Uh, so like Steve said, um, my name is Jesse Brubacher. I, I do see a lot of familiar faces here. So I think most of you uh, have probably already seen me at an info session. Um, but for those of you that didn't, uh, I'm the operations manager of the program. Uh, you've, at the very least, you've probably received an email or two from me. Um, so I don't have quite the tenure uh, that Steve has, uh, but I've only been with the VITA program for two tax seasons now. Uh, but I do have a, a very similar story in the sense that when I started with uh, the VITA program, you know, I originally I was just thinking of it as a resume builder. I did it as an internship. Uh, in college, and I was thinking that it was just that extra thing that I could put on my resume to go out and get that next bigger, better thing. Um, but at the time, I had never considered that Vita itself uh, would become uh, that bigger and better thing. And you know, it didn't take long; just a few weeks into the program, um, I I fell in love with it, and I I just absolutely loved uh, the value that we were providing to the community um, and the opportunity that we were creating in the lives of these low-income filers. So I want to thank all of you. Uh, for being here, um, because you know it's it's your volunteering uh, and it's your interest and and you know compassion to go out there and help these uh, low income filers that keeps that dream rolling. So thank you very much uh, for being here today. So the the way that we're gonna go through the training this morning, if I can get the PowerPoint to work, there we go. Um, is we're first going to go through just an overview of uh, the training process. So you've already got a little bit of this at your info session. Uh, so some of it's going to sound a little bit like review, uh, but for many of you, your info session may have been over a month ago, so I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, and also we do want to just take a look at training in a bit of a different light than we did before uh, and go over some things that you will uh, not have heard yet. Then we want to take a look uh, at an overview of scheduling and how we use that volunteer portal. Um, I, should have, I did send you an email. You should have received that. A lot of you did sign up for this uh, training session in that uh, software, um, but I just want to go over some little intricacies and details on how that software works. I also want to take the time to introduce you to a lot of the materials we used. I'm sure, we no I'm sure you noticed that when you walked in, we gave you a pile, an absolute pile of stuff. Um, you are not going to necessarily read that book front to back today, um, but I do want to just introduce you to it, tell you what we use it for, um, and just get you familiar with the resources I put in front of you. Um, and then I just want to take a really quick uh, thousand foot view um, at some tax law. Not really high level stuff, some of it is probably not going to make a whole lot of sense yet, uh, but it's just to kind of get you introduced to that tax law, uh, get your brain working on, on tax lines. Um, so that way, as we go through the rest of the trainings and we get more into tax law, you may see a few things that sound familiar. Um, and you know, this session is gonna take uh, roughly an hour, uh, give or take uh, just a few minutes. Uh, but the goal is just to give you the framework uh, of the training process and the different elements of it. Um, a lot of it is gonna sound overwhelming, um, but I promise you that you know, as we go through the trainings, as we go through the different sessions, uh, it will become much more manageable. And then also, before I get started, one more quick thing, uh, and that's regarding uh, questions. So I am recording this session for the people that were not able uh, to be here today. Um, and for the sake of that, we're just gonna ask that questions get uh, postponed until the end, because if we do them during, what ends up for the people listening to the recording is while you're asking the question, there's this really long period of silence, because they don't hear the question but then they hear me answer it and it's completely out of context and they have no idea what's going on. Um, so questions, we're gonna just postpone them until the end. That's what the note cards are on your table for. Um, if you have a question, just go ahead and write it down on the note card. Um, Michelle will be around periodically to pick those up uh, and we will address all of them at the end. Um, but so just go ahead and write them on that if you're afraid that you're gonna forget. So uh, let's go ahead then and just start with our uh, overview of training. And I think a really good thing to start with is what expectations did you have uh, going into the training process? And I just want to be really upfront and honest so you know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, and I think a good place to start is uh, the fact that you should expect to spend some time on your own. So we do provide uh, a lot of trainings, and I, I think the trainings that we provide give you all the information you need to know, or at least 95% of it, so that come January, you're able to sit down with a client and actually prepare that tax return. Um, but that's not to say that you aren't going to get home and go, you know, I remember something was said about that. I can't remember exactly what. Let me go back into the PowerPoint slides and check. 
or you know that didn't quite make sense while they were going over it, I want to go back to the PowerPoint slides, go back to the recording, listen to it again, and just make sure that I really understand uh, what was said about whatever topic it was that we were talking about. Um, and also, you know, that big old 4012 uh, in front of you, you may spend some time just looking through the pages of that. Once again, just familiarizing yourself with the materials, uh, just spending a little bit of time at home to make sure that you understand all the different tax law topics that we cover. Um, so the training session should be most of what you need, uh, but you will spend some supplementary time at home. Uh, we also recommend that you attend these classroom sessions. Being here today is a good start. Um, now we realize there are reasons that maybe you won't be able to make it to one. You know, you maybe you'll maybe you're signed up, but then the day of you wake up and you go, you know what, I'm really not feeling the best. I'm not able to make it to training. Uh, maybe a work event comes up. Maybe you already know that you're going to be on vacation during uh, one of those sessions. If you have to miss one, that's that's fine. Like I've said already, we do record them, um, but I do recommend as much as you can make it to these sessions because you know you get to interact uh, with your fellow volunteers um, and also it gives you a unique opportunity to ask questions it's a lot more difficult to ask questions when you're just watching a recording and I'm not right there um, so I do recommend attending the sessions but like I said if you can't make it it is not uh, the end of the world um, I also want to say that you should trust that this will get easier which is easy to say now, um, but it, it will. Training is definitely the biggest hurdle, right? A lot of people in this room don't have any prior tax knowledge, and that's fine. You know, our training is designed so that you can come in here without that tax knowledge and leave ready to prepare returns. Um, but there are times that it's going to seem daunting. Um, but as the training progresses, and then as we enter tax season, and then especially as the tax season progresses, things that seem you know, really daunting and, and, and really difficult now will eventually become second nature. Uh, so just trust uh, that this will get easier. Uh, and then finally, I just wanna say that nothing is uh, mandatory. So there are gonna be several things that we recommend. For example, I recommend that you attend all the training sessions, um, but we realize that that's not always possible. You know, Whether it's a work event or you start feeling sick, you may not be able to make it and that's fine. We don't require that you come to these uh, in person. We don't require that you come to any of the training sessions in person. Um, you can very easily volunteer without it, but it is recommended that you try. Um, so I also wanna just give you a few uh, tips for uh, success. You know, how can you approach this training uh, to make the most of it? And, and the first one, once again, really easy to say, a little bit harder to do, uh, is stay positive. Um, you know, the keeping a, a positive mindset is key to making it through the trainings because, like I've said, um, well, skip two. Uh, because, like I've said, uh, it's at times it's going to be daunting, and just being able to you know keep your eye on that final prize, keep your eye on the end goal, uh, is going to be really helpful for you. You know, just remember that even though it's, it's tough now, in a few months you are gonna be able to sit down with a client for 45 minutes to an hour, get them a thousand dollar refund and save them two to three hundred dollars. Uh, so just keep an eye on that, keep that end goal in mind um, because you will be able to really see uh, the gratitude on the client's face. I also recommend that you don't memorize anything. Uh, if you try to remember every number, every qualifier, every little detail, you are going to drive yourself insane. Um, do not try to remember it all. Um, instead, what's much more important is to be a good problem solver. Be able to be presented with a unique situation and go, I don't know how to handle that right now, but let me think through it and let me use my resources, let me ask my site coordinator uh, how exactly I should face this problem. Um, so it's not about knowing the answer right away, it's much more important to know where to find uh, the answer. So don't commit anything to memory. Also ask for help early uh, and often. You know, we do say that you know, it, it's our volunteers' responsibility to take advantage of the training program, but it's our responsibility to make sure that the training program prepares you. And if you're sitting there and you have a question, it may be very, it's very possible that we didn't explain that in the way that best suits you. Uh, so as you have questions, please ask. We wanna make sure that you have all the resources and all the help available uh, so that you can go from sitting here today to sitting in front of a client uh, come January. And at this point, I'm sure you're noticing that VITA is not 
your normal volunteering opportunity in the sense that there's a lot of there's a lot of effort that you have to put in on the front end you know you have to spend a good amount of time in this training process before you're even able to spend time volunteering what you're volunteering to do um, but it does pay off in a big way you know like Steve and I have both already said when we're when January rolls around and we're sitting down in front of our clients in just an hour we can you know, change, we provide that client with an opportunity to change their life in some cases. You know, we get to save them the tax prep fees that they spend elsewhere, and we also get them a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollar refund, and in some cases, even more. So, we do, uh, so like I've said, we, we provide the train, all the trainings necessary uh, to get you up to speed, uh, and we do it in two different pieces. And the first piece is the tax law piece. Uh, which uh, starts next week, where we really say, all right, what are the different uh, theories, what are the different um, just tax laws and, and pieces of information that you need to know uh, to be able to uh, prepare uh, a return. And, you know, we have several different training sessions. We go over things like filing status, uh, dependency, um, the, you know, different types of income, how to do a local return, uh, et cetera. And you know these sessions are they're typically going to take about three hours each, um, and that's kind of why we oftentimes incentivize you to spend some time at home over that period of three hours, or maybe something that you forget and need to go back and review. Um, but once again, for the people that can't make it, we also do uh, post it online. Um, one thing that I do want to mention regarding that final training, that last one listed there, is the advanced topics. So as first year volunteers, we are more than happy if you just go for the basic certification. If you're just going for the basic certification, you do not need to attend that advanced topic session. You may feel free to do so if you like, but you don't have to. Now that said, if you are going for the advanced certification, we do strongly recommend going to that session. Um, that session is going to go over things like self-employment. Um, it's going to take a closer look at itemized deductions, just all those things that are more advanced and difficult tax topics. Uh, so if you're just going for basic, don't worry about it. If you're going for advanced, it's probably beneficial. Um, now, the next piece is working with the software. You know, at that point, you're going to have learned all the different pieces of tax law. You're going to understand the different types of income. But now there's the question of how do we actually use the computer? How do we actually use the software to actually sit down with a client and, and prepare a return? So you'll remember just a few slides ago, I said that nothing is mandatory. And I do mean that. But if there's one session I recommend you attend, it's this one right here. Uh, these intros to the tax software are very, very helpful. Um, you know, they take about two and a half hours, and we actually go to the Hack uh, Lancaster campus. We sit in a computer lab, and we actually prepare a few practice returns. So it's, you know, it's the more applied uh, side of the training, where you are really getting some hands-on uh, experience. We do also, we split into two different sections, and we allow each of you to decide for yourself which section you go into, but we typically will split, in, split into a fast room and a slow room. Uh, and much like that sounds, one room is going to go a little bit faster, one room is going to take a little bit more time. Um, and one of the things that I encourage you to just weigh the most heavily is how, how comfortable do you feel with the computer? I mean, if you feel pretty good with the computer, then you're probably good to go into the fast room. If you know that you know it takes a little bit more time to navigate the different pages, just take some time in the slow room. Uh, but we let you make that decision for yourself. Then after that, we have open sessions, and these open sessions are really just some free and open uh, practice time. You know, it's it's going to be the first uh, training session where you don't really hear much of anything from Steve, Michelle, or I. Uh, instead, you just come in, sit down in front of a computer, and you can just practice. Um, and you know, it, it, those sessions are pretty beneficial as well because you get to sit alongside of other volunteers, and in a lot of cases, you get to sit next to uh, experienced, you know, veteran volunteers, people who have been doing it for a few years. And as you go through, if you have questions, you can ask those experienced veteran volunteers. Uh, Steve, Michelle, and I will be there walking around, and you can ask us questions. You know, it's a really good time to just play with the software um, and and talk about any troubles you've been having with it. Um, and also, actually, during those uh, open sessions, right before them, we're also going to have these state and local uh, mini sessions because there's three parts to every tax return. There's the federal return, the state return, and the local return. 
The 4012 that's in front of you goes over everything in the federal return. Uh, the certification exam that I've told you about focuses very heavily on the federal return. Um, and as a result, most of our volunteers end up feeling very comfortable with the federal side of the return. However, some feedback that we've gotten year after year from our volunteers is that the state and local side, some kind of slips through the cracks. Um, so we do want to provide those state and local mini sessions as a way for you to actually get a little bit more experience working with the state and local return in tax layer because that side is not covered on the test. Uh, so we just want to just get you some more experience in that piece. So I also want to take some time going through an overview of scheduling. So you probably have at least got a little bit of experience with this. Like I said, most of you have at least signed, most of you signed up for this session. Um, but I do want to take some time to show you the more, you know, the ins and outs of this scheduling software. Uh, so here I have just a quick screenshot of the login page. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get that opened. Um, so I have mine, actually, I have this page bookmarked on my computer. Uh, and I also have it set to just automatically populate my password, my username and password. If you want to do the same, feel free to do so. Just one uh, word of warning. Make sure that if you set it to remember your login info, make sure you remember it as well. Um, I can always provide you your username, but the first time you sign in, it makes you change your password. After that point, I can no longer give you a password. So you'll either need to try to retrieve it, reset it, um, or we'll try, we can try to do something else. But just do yourself a favor, write it down somewhere, make sure you remember your login info. Um, so just to give you a tour then of the, of the tax software, we're actually gonna, sorry, of the scheduling software, we're gonna log in uh, to, this, to the volunteer portal. Uh, and you're greeted on this home screen. So there's not really a whole lot here. Uh, it does give you just a brief description of what each tab is used for, uh, but that's exactly what I wanna go over now. So we're gonna start our tour with the full schedules tab. The full schedules tab is where you find the full schedule of trainings and shifts. Um, and it's where you're going to be able to actually sign up for training sessions uh, and shifts. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign up for the training session uh, that is happening next week, just to kind of show you how this process is done. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and scroll to November, uh, which you can, you can move through months uh, by using those two arrows at the top of the, the month column. So I'm gonna get to November and I'm going to select November 7th and I want to attend the evening session. So it's very important to pay attention to the little header uh, at the top of each section. You know, because you can see right there, if, if I would sign up for that one, that would be the morning session. So I have to make sure that I scroll down and, and sign up for the one that is happening in the evening. Those headers tell you the, the time, they tell you uh, the location that you're signing up for, and they also tell you what it is that you're signing up for. So right now I'm signing up for the uh, first tax law training at Highland Presbyterian Church from 5 at 5.30 on November 7th. So I'm gonna go ahead and click the volunteer now button. And that brings up this little dialogue box um, and it tells you that you can, you know, it, once again, it tells you which session you're signing up for. So it's good to double check, make sure that you have selected the right one, the one that you want to sign up for. Uh, and it also gives you an opportunity to put in some comments. Don't put in any comments. Uh, I'll be honest, we don't read them. Um, <laughs> if you have a concern about uh, the trainings, just, just send me an email. Uh, you should all have my contact information. Just shoot it to me. I'm, I'm fairly responsive with emails. I do not check the comments. So I'm going to go ahead and confirm that that is the appointment that I, sorry, that is the, the session that I want to go to. And you can see that now my name uh, is in that box and I am registered to go to that training. So now, you know, once you start signing up for a bunch of trainings, we can then go to the My Schedules tab. The My Schedules tab is going to show you all the different things that you have signed up for. So we can see the session that I'm at right now. Um, and we can also see the session that I just signed up for on November 7th. And also at the far right, you can see that there's that little uh, cancel option. Um, so if you do need to cancel out a session, that's fine. Uh, just log into VSP, uh, click that cancel option. Once again, it is going to give you an opportunity to write comments. Don't write comments, we don't read them. Um, so just go ahead and confirm that you are canceling that appointment and that should take you out of uh, the register. Now, 
One thing that I do want to mention regarding canceling appointments, if you have to cancel during the training, that's fine. Just go ahead and remove yourself from the list. The only reason we have you register is so we know roughly how many tables to set up, and we also know how much coffee to make, how many you know uh, granola bars and Nutrigrain, uh, Nutrigrain bars to bring. Um, but it's much more important once we actually get into the tax season. Uh, if you have to cancel a shift in, let's say, less than a week's notice, it's important to not only remove yourself from the schedule, but also make sure your site coordinator knows about it. You know, you're not asking off, they're not gonna tell you no, um, but instead it's just to make sure they have time to prepare so they can see if they can get another volunteer to come in, uh, just to make sure that they have enough staffing to help all the clients that have appointments. Uh, so it's just to make the, the site coordinator aware of that change. Um, and also a quick note, the mobile version of this site is, is slightly different. Um, instead of using the full schedules tab to sign up, for whatever reason, it doesn't let you use the full schedules slide, uh, tab to sign up. Instead, there's a different tab called open schedules. You need to just click on open schedules uh, and then click volunteer now. Uh, but that's on the mobile side. If you're gonna be doing everything from the desktop, what I just showed you will work fine. Um, and finally, I wanna show you the my profile tab. The my profile tab uh, just kind of goes over just information about you. You know, it has your name, it has your phone number, it has your email address, it has your actual address. Um, and just know that if you wanna change the phone number that we use to contact you, just go ahead and change the phone number. If you wanna change the email that we use to contact you, you can just go ahead and change the email. Um, also, there is the opportunity that if, if you want two emails, if you want, if you have two different email addresses and you want uh, our emails to go to both, uh, you can enter a second one, uh, just separate them by with a comma. Um, and then finally, at the very bottom of this page, uh, there is an option there that you can choose to have a training, like a, a reminder sent to you, um, a, a specified number of days before you're actually, you know, at the site. Uh, so I can set it so that I want a reminder the day before I'm scheduled. Uh, this can be very helpful during training, just, you know, so if you lose track of days, you can be like, oh, right, there's a training session tomorrow at, in the morning that I need to attend. Uh, so that's up to you if you want to uh, activate that, but it is there for you to do so if you would like. So uh, that's all that I'm gonna show you in uh, the software, uh, but I do wanna quick go back to the PowerPoint just to let you know a few more things uh, about um, volunteer, volunteering for shifts. So once the actual tax season begins, volunteering at the sites. So I do recommend and I do encourage uh, trying to establish a regular schedule. So you know whether you're gonna volunteer one shift a week, two shifts a week, three shifts a week, or, or even more, um, I recommend trying to, try to, just try to make it so that you're volunteering maybe every Tuesday night, or maybe every Thursday night, or maybe every Tuesday night and every Thursday night, just to have that regularity and consistency, because the reason that it's really helpful for us is it allows us, if we know that a certain number of volunteers is typically gonna be at that site at a certain time, that helps us know how many appointments we can schedule at that time. Uh, so having that regular schedule is very helpful to us and our clients. Um, also, uh, if you could try to just have a rough idea of what your schedule is going to be uh, by January, by the second week of January, um, simply because at that point we start having what we call site orientations. And I did mention those a little bit at the uh, info session that most of you attended, um, but essentially those site orientations are just giving you the lay of the land at your specific site. You know, where, are, where do we keep the supplies? Um, you know, what's the Wi-Fi password in case your computer gets disconnected? Just little things like that. Um, and that way, you, if you know which site you're gonna spend the most time at, you know which orientation to attend. Um, and also, a question that I do get very frequently is, can I sign up to more than one site? Absolutely. Uh, so we have plenty of volunteers that say, you know what? I live in Ephrata, it's, con it's most convenient for me to just volunteer at Ephrata. And that's the only site that they go to, which is fine. Uh, but we also have some volunteers that say, you know what, I work in, I work in Lancaster. Uh, so it's very convenient for me on Thursday nights to go to the CAP site. But I live in Ephrata, so if I'm volunteering Saturday morning, I'm not gonna drive all the way out to Lancaster, I'm just gonna volunteer my time at the Ephrata site. So if you do wanna split your time between different sites, that is more than okay. Uh, you'll actually also notice uh, throughout the season we have certain things like blitz days, which are essentially just uh, essentially just a few days where we have we open a site that typically we don't have open, 
uh, but we try to do as many returns in a small period of time uh, as we possibly can. And we usually do call on a lot of different volunteers to pitch in to those blitz days. So you will see that. Um, and also, sometimes, let's say uh, the, our CAP site is a little bit understaffed. We may send out an email saying, hey, this Thursday, for whatever reason, CAP's a little short on volunteers. If anybody's interested in ABLE, uh, we could use a few more volunteers at the CAP site. So there's different things you'll see as the season progresses that you do have opportunities to volunteer at just more than one tax site. Um, so now that we've kind of gone over our overview of training and our overview of scheduling, uh, I want to start taking a look at all the materials. Uh, so we're going to cover a lot of the materials that are right in front of you, and we're also going to cover some of the materials that aren't. Uh, but the first one that I want to go over is our volunteer guide. So this is something that we actually put together ourselves, uh, and it can be located uh, on Google Drive. Uh, actually, Michelle, do you mind going back to the PowerPoint real quick? Uh, so we have it set up, um, we have a, a specific URL, uh, and that's in uh, the, the PowerPoint slides that we have printed out for you. Um, but if you just type in that URL to your search bar, uh, it'll bring you to uh, our Google Drive. If you're accessing this from home, uh, you can just try to, you can bookmark that yourself, you can try to add it to your own Google Drive. Uh, but once we're actually out at the sites, we're gonna have it bookmarked, uh, loaded onto all of our computers. Uh, so you only really need to know this URL if you're trying to access it from home. Uh, so I wanna actually take some time to go into that Google Drive now. Um, so we've generated this drive based off of feedback from our volunteers. So it's a lot of information that is more specific uh, to our VITA program. It's gonna be a lot of procedural stuff. It's also just gonna have a lot of resources that our volunteers have asked for um, a lot. So one thing that we have on here, for example, is let's say that once the tax season begins, you're sitting, you're sitting down with a client and you are trying to prepare a property tax and rent rebate for them. And you're going, you know what? This person's a first time filer. Um, I know that there was something special about this. I can't remember exactly what. So you can go to this Google Drive. Uh, we do have a folder on the property tax and rent rebate. Uh, we can go into this uh, little document here um, and actually look up what happens uh, if somebody is a first time filer. Um, so a lot of what I said, you know, you're not gonna understand so far what a, PA, one, what a property tax and rent rebate is maybe, uh, but just knowing that there are uh, resources here available to you is very helpful. Um, so I also want to, uh, to go over the 4012. So the 4012 is that big book uh, that is in front of you right now. Um, We're going to be working with this a lot. You know, this is going to be your primary resource book, not only through trainings, but during the tax season as well. Uh, we reference this a lot. We, we use it in trainings. There's a lot of very helpful piece of information in this. You know, it's full of advice on how to, how to use tax layer. Uh, it covers a lot of different rules, and it's also full of different tables, uh, figures, and, and charts. Uh, so it is going to be something that you are going to get very, very familiar with. So it is available in print, uh, which you know you have in front of you. Uh, to navigate it, you can just use those tabs to kind of quickly flip to uh, one section. It is also available online. Um, so if you just go into Google and type uh, Pub4012, one of the first options should be a PDF version of this document. It's up to you. You can use whichever version of it you prefer, whether you like going online or you like using the paper copy. But if you do like going online, one of the really convenient things is let's say that you are sitting down with a client and you're wondering what filing status they should be. You can go to the table of contents page, look for the filing status decision tree, and you can just click on the page number and it takes you right there. Um, so you don't need to spend your time rifling through the book. You can instead just find the, you know, just go to the table of contents and, and navigate right to it. Um, so it's up, like I said, up to you which version you prefer. I just wanna make sure that you do know that online is an option. Uh, so the next resource I want to talk about is the 4491. Uh, so Michelle, if you go back to the PowerPoint. Yeah. Oh, there we go. So the 4491, uh, I'm sure you're going to start noticing a trend, by the way. Uh, the IRS is not very creative. Uh, they are going to name everything 4012, 4491. It's all numbers. Uh, I think they have a long way to go before they win author of the year. Um, so the 4491, just kind of think of it as your uh, textbook. 
Uh, it can be something that really complements the training. Um, unfortunately, this resource is only available online. They do not send it out in, in printed text, um, but if you are interested, you can go onto Google, just type in Pub 4491, uh, and it once again, the PDF version should be one of the first things that pops up. So it can be kind of helpful to uh, review the 4491 before or after uh, these classroom trainings. So one of the papers that you should have picked up when you first came in uh, is going to be called the VITA uh, Training Guide. Uh, so just see if you can find that real quick. Because what this training guide does is it actually lays out um, which chapters of the 4491 we're going to be going over uh, during each training. So you know you can see there that class one we're going to be talking about filing status and dependency, and that covers chapters five to eight of the 4491. So I do not expect you to read the 4491 front to back. Um, Instead, it's just something that is available to you. It can be helpful, but once again, you kind of decide if that's something that's going to be uh, helpful for you or not. You get to choose if you want to do it. But for those of you that do, uh, just use that training guide as a resource to tell which chapters will be covered which day. Uh, so then we have the Pub 6744. Uh, once again, they lack a lot of creativity, um, but this Pub 6744 is another one of the things you should have picked up on the way in. This is your uh, test booklet. So like I've tried to say already at info sessions is the test is not something you need to worry about because you know, you're not taking the test until January, but now you have all the questions. Um, so in that test book, you're going to see that it's, it's broken down and there's several different tests in there. Essentially, they break it down into several sections. The first one is the volunteer standards of conduct. That is just your ethics piece. And it really just, it, it's making sure that you know that you're not allowed to charge uh, taxpayers for your service. You're not allowed to accept money. Uh, it's making sure that you know that you're not using taxpayer information for your own benefit. Just the ethics piece and everything that you'd expect to come with that. Uh, then after that, we have the intake interview and quality review. <clears throat> and what that's for is making sure that you're able to, it, it kind of helps guide you through how to gather information from the client. You know, how do you sit down with a client uh, and just talk to them so that you have an idea of how to approach uh, this tax return. And then there's also the basic or the advanced certification. So once again, I, I've, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. As a first year volunteer, if you wanna just go for basic, that is absolutely fine. We completely understand. Um, and in that case, you know, just take the basic certification test. If you wanna go for advanced, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, just make sure that you take the advanced test. And if you're going for advanced, you do not need to take the basic. It's not like you need to take the basic, then take the advanced. You just take whichever test it is that you're going for. You don't need to take both. Um, and then after that, there are several ones that are more optional. Uh, we have, there's the HSA, there's uh, international, and there's uh, military. We do strongly recommend going for the HSA. Uh, we don't encounter military or international returns very often, but HSA has become more and more common. Uh, so HSA just stands for health savings accounts. We've seen those, you know, as, as employers have been moving more and more towards high deductible health plans, uh, we really do see a lot of people come in with these HSAs. Uh, so having that certification really will help because it's, it's something that we see a lot. Um, and also, something else you'll notice is that there's, so there's several different tests, and there's also two versions of each test. There's the test, and there's the retest. So essentially, you know, you're gonna go, you're gonna work through that book, and you're gonna come up with answers to the test. You're gonna go online uh, to fill them out uh, come January, and essentially, you're either going to pass or you're not gonna pass. Most people pass the first time, but if you don't, don't worry about it. Um, because there is the opportunity to try again, they do let you take uh, a retest. It's just that now they're gonna ask you slightly different questions with modified numbers, uh, just slightly different scenarios. Uh, but ultimately, it is a very similar test. We actually recommend taking both from the very start. And the reason we say that is because first off, it's good practice, but also, if you do the test and then right away do the retest, 
doing them both at the same time, doing one can kind of help you narrow down your options in the other. So they kind of give you hints in a, in a, in a bit of a way to how what the answer may be on each different test. Uh, so it can be very helpful uh, to do that. Uh, so like I've said, once you take the test on paper, you can move over then to uh, Vita Central. Um, I, we're not going to go too much over this right now, but I do just want you to see this website. Um, this is where you actually go online and submit uh, the exam. Um, there's a number of other things on this website as well. Um, it's up to you if you find them useful, but there are a lot of things like practice questions and, and different scenarios. Uh, we don't integrate them specifically into our training, uh, but once we get to the, the hack trainings, once we get uh, over to those you know, tax software trainings, we will show you this site and you can decide if using them is helpful for you. So the next thing I want to go over is the intake sheet. So once again, this is something you probably picked up on your way in the door today. Um, and you should have actually picked up two pieces of paper regarding the intake sheet. So the first one is just a little packet. Um, and this is essentially every time a client walks in the door, they are going to receive an intake sheet. And before they sit down with you to get their return prepared, they need to fill this out. And what you should really think of this as is your, think of it as a conversation starter. You know, the client may not have always necessarily filled it out 100% correctly, um, but, you know, on the first page, it asks them, you know, from just looking at the first page, you know their name, uh, you know their date of birth, you know their address, you know the people that live in their house, so you can start to attack that dependency question. Um, and as it goes on, you know, it starts to ask questions like, where did you receive your income from? You know, did you receive income from employment? Did you receive interest income? Did you receive retirement income? So as you look at this intake sheet, it kind of paints a picture of what the return is going to look like. Um, and it just helps you know what, what forms you're going to expect to see. You know, so if somebody says on the intake sheet, I received income from employment, you know you're looking for a W-2. And if as you're going through the paperwork, you don't find a W-2, that's a conversation starter. Say, I, you know, I saw that you uh, checked that you received income from employment, but I don't see the document supporting that. Is that something you left at home, uh, or do you have it in your purse? Uh, where is that document so I can get it on uh, to the return? The other form, uh, the other uh, piece of, the other material that you picked up on your way in uh, was the job aid uh, for that uh, return. Sorry, for that intake sheet. And what really help, what this really helps with is. I, I know that the intake sheet at first can just look like a bunch of boxes and words, um, and that job aid is just to kind of help break down the, the value behind each question, uh, just to get you more familiar with, okay, how do I look at the intake sheet? How do I read the intake sheet? What information am I trying to pull from it? So something I do recommend is take a little bit of time looking at those two, those two forms. Um, just to get familiar with it. That way, once we start actually preparing tax returns, you know what you're looking at. So I also did mention at the start that I wanted to take some time uh, to just go over a, a basic review of tax law. Uh, and like I said before, this is gonna be a really quick thousand foot view. Um, some of it isn't going, a lot of it isn't gonna sound familiar. Um, a lot of it, at this point, you may not necessarily follow, which is fine. Uh, we're gonna go much more in depth into all of these things uh, as the training progresses. For now, I just wanna introduce you to it and kind of get your brain working on those uh, tax uh, lines. And I wanna start with giving you some common tax terminology, uh, because there's gonna be a lot of terms that we throw around uh, during the trainings. Um, and just kind of having you know what they mean or have a rough idea of what they mean uh, going in is very helpful. And hands down, the most important one, uh, the one that we probably talk about the most, is adjusted gross income. Or as we simplify it, we just call it AGI. Um, so AGI is it's somebody's, uh, it's an individual's total gross income 
minus any specific deductions. Um, we'll get into more detail what deductions may be part of that as the training progresses, um, but for now just know that AGI is a measure of somebody's income and it's going to be used a lot to determine what credits do they qualify for. Uh, just a lot of things like that. We will throw around the term AGI very often. Um, there's also uh, dependent. So a lot of you probably know this one already. Um, you know, if, if you have kids, chances are you have at some point claimed uh, a dependency exemption, but it's a person other than the taxpayer or their spouse that you're able to put on the return uh, to get them some type of tax benefit. You know, in most cases, it's going to be their, their son or daughter. Um, in some cases, it can be a brother or a sister. Um, but nonetheless, uh, dependent is something that we do come across a lot as well. So the next one is estimated tax. Admittedly, we don't see that one very often, but when it comes up, it is important to know what it means. So most people receive money from employment. That's where most people receive their income. And in that case, taxes are automatically withheld. You know, every time that taxpayer gets their paycheck, the employer has typically already withheld a little bit of taxes and sent it off to the government. And the whole purpose of filing a tax return is to apply for that refund, to try to get some money back. But there are cases in which people don't pay taxes throughout the year. If they're self-employed, right? You know, there's no employer to just automatically withhold for them. If somebody receives a lot of income from capital gains, there's nobody to just automatically withhold taxes. So these people oftentimes have to make their own estimated tax payments, where essentially they look at their own information and say, all right, I expect to make this much money. That means I'm expecting to, to, have, to pay this much in taxes. I'm going to make these estimated tax payments myself. So once again, we don't see it very often, uh, but it does, it does come up once in a while. Then there's, there's gross income. So gross income is not nearly as important as adjusted gross income. Uh, but gross income essentially is just how much did somebody make, period. It's not worrying about any deductions. It's just asking how much money did this person make throughout the year. Uh, so then there's a standard deduction. Once again, we are this one is, is also thrown around a lot. Um, so the standard deduction is something that every taxpayer gets just for filing their taxes. You know, the IRS says the first however many dollars of your return, we're not going to tax it. That is your standard deduction that you get just for being alive. The IRS is very generous. Um, uh, but then finally, there is taxable income. Taxable income is your adjusted uh, gross income uh, minus any allowances, uh, minus your standard deduction, just how much of all of your income is the IRS actually going to levy a tax on. Uh, so now that we've covered some terminology, I also want to talk about the new tax law, or at this point, maybe not so new. Um, but so just last year was the first year that we were working with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And there were a lot of changes that were made by that. And I just want to take some time, you know, saying, you know, how did taxes used to be and how has the Tax Cuts and Job Act changed that? And one of the biggest changes was to having to do with the standard deduction. Um, just this, so last year it was, it was doubled uh, from what it used to be before the Tax Cuts and Job Act. And they've actually upped it a little bit more this year as well. Uh, so this year, your standard deduction is going to be anywhere between uh, $12,200 if you're filing uh, single uh, or $24,400 if you're filing uh, as a married filing joint return. Um, and then also, uh, they have, to make up for that doubling of the standard deductions, they actually did away uh, with personal exemptions. So you no longer get to claim just a personal exemption for you and your spouse. Uh, they view the doubling of the standard deduction as, as recompense uh, for that. They also changed the child tax credit. Uh, this credit is one of the ones that's very lucrative for the clients that we serve. And they actually changed it so that now the child tax credit, uh, it doubled. You know, you're able to get $2,000 of credit per qualifying child, and 1,400 of it can actually be received as a refundable credit. What that means, uh, for those of you that don't know, is refundable credits can actually be applied above and beyond your tax due. So it can actually go towards a refund. Or in other words, you can get more out of your tax return than you ever put in. Um, so that can be a very lucrative credit uh, for the clients that we serve. 
Um, there's also now this, this new rule that includes an option of getting a $500 uh, non-refundable credit for other dependents. You know, somebody that isn't necessarily your qualifying child, but nonetheless was your dependent, you know, lived with you all year, uh, and you were providing all of their support. So you can claim a credit for that now as well. You didn't used to be able to. Um, and starting this year, uh, there's actually a, uh, a, new, a new rule regarding alimony. So it used to be that if uh, a taxpayer got uh, divorced, uh, and had to make alimony payments. The person making the alimony payments could deduct them on their tax return, and the person receiving the alimony payments would be able to, would have to report them as income. For any divorce decrees settled after January of 2019, or any of them modified after January of 2019, it's changed so that it's neither deductible or taxable. The person paying the, the alimony does not take it as a deduction, the person receiving the alimony does not report it as income. Instead, it is just not showing, alimony will not be showing up on the return anymore uh, for any divorce decrees settled after 2019. Um, so then uh, there's also, uh, what happens if somebody wants to itemize deductions? Uh, so itemizing deductions is, is an advanced topic, and it's also, since the standard deduction was doubled, we don't see it a whole lot anymore. Uh, but one of the big ways that somebody is able to itemize is if they had a lot of medical expenses. That's one of the biggest ways that people can really quickly rack up a lot of deductions. Uh, so it used to be that uh, taxpayers were allowed to deduct out-of-pocket medical expenses that exceeded 10% of their AGI. There's that word AGI. Like I said, we will talk about this a lot. Um, but if the taxpayer was 65 or older, that percentage was reduced to 7.5. So if if there was if they paid more than 7.5 percent uh, of their AGI medical expenses, they could start deducting them as well. Uh, they did recently change that so that it's just a flat uh, 10 percent across the board, regardless of age. Um, and then finally, I just want to take a really quick look at the Affordable Care Act. So you know, as with most of the topics I just covered, we will cover this a lot more in depth later in the training. Um, but for those of you that are familiar, the Affordable Care Act essentially made it be that everybody needed to have uh, health care coverage. And if you didn't have health care coverage, the IRS would actually penalize you with this thing called a shared responsibility payment, where, you know, at tax time, they'd say, okay, you didn't have health insurance, we still need you to pay into the system, so we're going to charge you some money now on your tax bill. They actually just did away with that uh, starting this year. Uh, so when we're preparing returns for people, um, if they didn't have health insurance, uh, there is no longer that shared responsibility payment. There's no longer that penalty. Now that said, we will still be talking about the Affordable Care Act quite a bit uh, because people that still go to the marketplace and still get their coverage through the marketplace, they're still going to receive 1095As. We're still going to need to do. Uh, we're still going to need to report that on uh, the tax return. But at least you no longer will have angry clients uh, that they are having to pay this penalty uh, for not having health insurance that they couldn't afford in the first place. So I do want to just take some time really quickly. Uh, I'm going to. I'm about to wrap up, um, but uh, just want to give you a few more pieces of information. So contact info. Uh, on the very back of your binder, in the back cover, so it's not in the binder, it's actually close the binder and flip it over. Um, there is a bunch of contact information uh, that has numbers for you to be able to contact, you know, let's say the IRS help hotline, uh, or let's say you want to contact uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue, maybe you want to contact the, the property tax and rent rebate people to just kind of ask them a question on, on, you know, how do you do this return. Uh, those numbers are there. But I think the most important one for you, um, especially if you're here as a site coordinator, is going to be that, um, that on-call phone. So that on-call phone, which is also on the screen behind me, will always take you to Steve, Michelle, uh, or myself. Um, if a site is open, one of us is responding to that, to that phone. And essentially what makes it really helpful is, you know, let's say that you are at the site and you're preparing a tax return. And you're sitting there and you're going, you know what? I have never faced this problem before. I have no idea what to do in this situation. I've checked the 4012. I've looked online. I still wasn't able to figure out what I wanted to do. I asked my site coordinator. They didn't know what we were supposed to do. At that point, you know, that on-call number is there for you to call and say, hey, look, this is the problem we're facing. What do we do in this situation? 
right? Hopefully, Steve, Michelle, or I can just give you an answer and have you go. Um, but sometimes you are still going to call that number and then we're gonna go, you know what? I have never encountered that before. I have no idea. Uh, let me go ahead and, and look into that. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that even if, you know, you know that, that's, that there is your worst case scenario, right? Where you don't know, your site coordinator doesn't know, and we don't know. Even in that case, the worst thing that happens, we just tell that taxpayer, look, I'm going to be honest, this situation kind of threw us for a loop. Um, we're going to need some more time to think about this, to think about how we want to approach it correctly. So what we'll do is we're going to keep researching this. We'll give you a call when we're actually ready to finish this tax return. Uh, but you know, 99% of our clients are much more happy with a correct return uh, than a fast return. So if we need to send them away and take some time to think about it, that's fine. Uh, we also have a website. Uh, so this website is something that a lot of our clients use. Uh, starting this year, we're actually going to have the ability to schedule your appointment online. Um, and then also a lot of our volunteers, you know, a lot of you guys actually use this website to sign up for info sessions, right? That's how you got in contact with me. Um, so that, that website is really helpful. We do also plan on getting a lot more resources on there. Um, so as we add more things to it, we'll keep you posted. Um, I've also mentioned that we post all of our trainings to YouTube. This is where all the recordings end up. So at the end of every week, we do send out a link uh, to that to the specific recording. Um, but if you just want to check out our entire an, our entire channel, just go onto YouTube, uh, type in Lancaster Vita, and it will take you to our channel. And you can view all the trainings that we posted from this year. If you're interested, you can even look at trainings we posted from prior years. We we do leave them all up. Um, but so that is our YouTube channel. Uh, and then finally, I do want to just direct you to, we do have a Facebook site. Uh, so our, on Facebook, we do post a lot of things regarding to upcoming trainings. So if a training's in the next two days, oftentimes Michelle uh, will post, you know, just a reminder, hey, look, the training's coming up. Uh, just keep in mind that, you know, we're going to be at Highland Presbyterian Church going over filing status and dependency. Uh, so if you can just leave us a like, it does, it does kind of help us reach more potential volunteers. And also during the tax season, it can even help us reach more clients just to let them know, hey, we're here uh, to help you. So um, that wraps up uh, everything uh, that I uh, had prepared. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and stop the recording. But as soon as I do that, I am going to take some time to answer any questions that you may have.